pimp slapping Dracoliches since 1989. It is I, your main man, returned to speak about Dungeons and Dragons. Next. That's right, you've been screaming, begging for it, and now your chieftain responds like a hailstorm against your mind. We're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons next. Now, my review capacity is only as follows. I have read the information provided by Wizards of the Coast for free on their site regarding the that basic bits of information. Now, if you're watching this a thousand years from now, or even in the year 2525, you will find out that you have information at your disposal that I do not have. Yes, I don't need you to tell me that they now have the Paladin class in the game. I'm kind of figuring that. But what they had at the time was the sort of simple, more core ideas, the classic sort of Dungeons Dragons things that they're like, well, you, you know we have dwarves in the game, so here you go. Now, it definitely seemed like they provided more than enough to have a playtest. I will certainly first of all give them kudos on that. They were generous to provide that information for free and quite honestly if you were experienced in Dungeons and Dragons you could you could run a whole campaign off the information they gave you. It might it might not have quite enough information to run multiple campaigns but it's a pretty it's a pretty generous amount of free information. I will certainly give them that but Let's talk about one of the things that I like the best. Probably the thing I like the best overall. I think they handled religion well. Religion is the sort of thing that can take up a tremendous amount of space in a game book. And a player's handbook space is at a premium. So from a game design point, they handled it better than any of the other editions of Dungeons and Dragons. They presented the archetypes. They have the trickster, they have the warrior, the mage, the uh, the thunder god. There are a few others in there. And they talk about real world deities. They talk about Odin and Thor and Zeus, but then they talk about Forgotten Realms deities. They talk about Greyhawk deities, which leads me to believe you will have both Forgotten Realms and Greyhawk in D&D next. The campaign settings, always one of the huge selling points of Dungeons and Dragons. There's so many of them out there. People, I'm sure, are very interested to see which campaign settings are going to actively receive support from Dungeons and Dragons next. One of the, the ways they really rope people in and, and, and get you interested in buying a lot of supplements for you know, your Ray Winloff game, your Dark Sun game, your Planescape game, your Dragonlance game, your Mysteria game, your Forgotten Realms game, whatever it is, those campaign settings are one of the biggest draws into the Dungeons and Dragons collective. So, seeing those in the book, uh, or in the, in the PDF, definitely leads me to believe that they will be providing some setting material for that and probably several other settings as well. Now, you also had these archetypes in there that were, were kind of interesting but they they seemed almost to come off like feet trees. They might not have been called archetypes but if you're, you're paying attention you know what they're called. That doesn't matter. But they seem to come off more feet trees. They need to sort of embellish those archetypes a bit more. They probably need, they had a little bit of information, they probably need a good solid paragraph more to explain those, bring them home in, in the book. I don't know if they'll do it. I'm, I'm leaning towards probably not role-playing and not looking like it is a priority in this edition of Dungeons and Dragons. We'll talk more about that, and <laughs> you know I will. So, uh, we'll come back to that. So, after you, you look at the, the divinities section there, we're going right to race. That's right, we're going to be racist against all things right now. So I looked through some of them. I, I didn't bother looking at the human apparently. We'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Uh, but they had four. Of course they have the holy trinity of D&D. The, the human, the dwarf, the elf, and somehow the halfling slips in there. I don't know I don't know why. They I guess are happy to be in there and somebody seems to like them I guess. I'm not a fan of halflings. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Uh, so I don't really see I don't see their inclusion as being a, a smart idea. If for for a, uh, I can think of I can think of all the races that are there <laughs> except for gnomes. I was going to say I can think of a few, but uh, we could go on for a long time talking about things I would put in a player's handbook before halfling. But but let's talk about that for a minute. I wonder what other races we we'll use that misnomer are going to be provided in their player's handbook. Uh, I'm guessing half elves will be in there. That's pretty, pretty standard, easy guess there, I suppose. 
One that I don't know why it hasn't been in, a, in any actual player's handbook, not in, you know, Kings of Calamar book or something like that, but an actual Hobgoblin. Hobgoblin scream, I am a player race! There is nothing non-player racy about them. Yes, they're lawful evil, but that too is, is quite uh, player raceable. They, they have a society that can be expanded and, and created in a great way. In fact, Hobgoblins probably should rule almost every D&D world there is. They breed like crazy, are lawful evil, and just as smart as everyone else. So, and then they're large, too, like what, six and a half foot tall. So, I don't see any reason you wouldn't have them as a player's handbook base race to pick. But again, probably not. Uh, I don't know if they're going to put half orcs in there or not. The the dragon, what do they call the dragon men from fourth edition, whatever they were. Let's hope they don't come back. They were, uh, they just weren't, they weren't popping well. We're going to make a little little race in there. I would suppose Cobalt would also make a very viable option. I'm going to guess probably not, though. But the way they divided race was very good. I like that. Typically, in a lot of the older editions of D&D, it'd be like, you're playing an elf, and every elf is just the same. A drow elf, a wood elf, a gold elf, uh, a, 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 a booty elf. They all have exactly the same stats. Here they are. Play them. They're all the same. Just change the name and change the, the, the skin tone and hair. But <laughs> that same edition, yeah, creep. And we have books come out that explain exactly what the statistical modifiers are for your drow, for your wood elf, for, for your stream elf, for, for, for an elf that has three stones on their head. And they have each and every one of them. And so you have like 35 different kinds of elves, all statistically different with different statistical advantages and different stat modifiers, which renders what it said here completely a lie. So it creates a problem. They don't do that in this edition, and I really liked that a lot. They have a divide. You had your, your High Elf, which I don't know why they picked the word High Elf to use for Grey Elf or Gold Elf. In the older editions, the High Elf was a standard basic Elf in the book, the plus one dex, minus one con. The Gold Elf or Grey Elf was the smart one, with minus two penal, penalty to strength. But they, they for use, some reason, used High Elf for intelligence, whatever. Don't bother explaining to me, I don't care. It, semantics. But it is a little, it's just a little annoying uh, to someone who has played from the older of the older games, it just it seems like you're picking the wrong the wrong word, you know. So they they have those in the game, and they had some other kind of elf. The elves have it's some slight differences in the the abilities that they got, and one had a bonus to dex, one had a bonus to intelligence. I of course for my character picked a the guy with a bonus to intelligence. After all, we we're going to play this as a game, so I read the information. The guy before the kickoff, he fumbled the game. How how much worse can it get? So. When you, when you have that kind of a deal. Uh, but so that's basically what my information to review the game is based off of. Now, besides... Uh, oh, let's talk about this. They have a, mod, a, a game mech in there that you have dice that can go from like... Uh, you, you, you know I love this one. When you're swinging on an elf, an elf has a long sword. Instead of swinging a D8, he gets a D10 to damage. Oh boy, you know I love to see elves with long swords, and it looks like at D&D next, every elf will have a long sword. Oh yeah, baby, because <laughs> we don't have any room for originality here. Uh, incentivizing, if you're going to incentivize a species to use a weapon, incentivize a species to use a weapon that is not optimal, because then it puts an optimal weapon in play in a position where it becomes on par or slightly superior to an optimal weapon. When you take an optimal weapon, aka a long sword, which is D&D's D&D loves a long sword. Uh, would you you have that incentivized, optimized weapon? <laughs> Game over. Every elf has a longbow, a long sword. What the hell ever? You're getting that die modifier jump, and I think dwarfs got the same thing for axes. That the die modifier jumps up. That mechanic I do not like at all. Again, I think it would work fine if you're like, okay. All elves are really good with short swords, because short swords are not an optimal weapon. We don't really have a place for short sword. Why would you pick a short sword? Well, the elf is just as good with a short sword as he is with a long sword. How about that? We jump from like a D6 to a D8, and all of a sudden, you're like, oh, okay, we got a place for the short sword. There's a reason for it to be included. It's not just a dump weapon. It's not just a weapon to fill the list out. I don't like that. I like weapons to have a purpose and a meaning and a use. And, you know, that that's, that's it starts to being... Uh, overpowered. I I saw that particular idea there as a problem, and I would not be surprised to see if you have an expansion of that. Now you can kick that 
Long sword up to a D12! Ha ha ha! With, you know, the, the, the complete book of elves and power gaming. You're, you're going to have that option in there. So, uh, the other thing... Well, let me talk about races. And this is the thing that I really <laughs> did not like in the race section. I argued with the guy that was playing the, running the game because, <laughs> like a dumbass, I thought I'd read this. I had not. I don't usually read humans and games because I don't play humans and games. I don't really like humans... They're boring. I get to be a human every single day, except when I game. And when I game, I play something else. I was going to play an elf because, let's face it, I wasn't going to play a halfling or a dwarf. So I was like, oh, an elf. It was like there was one choice for me. And the choice I wasn't going to make again is also a human. Well, humans are no longer down the line. They are not the standard bar to measure things by. There isn't one. It means statistical modifiers are completely irrelevant. Ground your abstractions. I don't know if the people who wrote this game, from a mechanical standpoint, have ever taken a creative writing class, but that is a word, a term, rather, that you will hear a lot. Ground your abstractions. A statistical modifier, yeah, particularly DD, is essentially an abstraction. What do you have a plus one bonus over? What are you better than? Humans in this game have a plus one bonus to everything, a plus one bonus to one stat. The elf, again, plus one bonus to dex or intelligence. That means you're a human. Sorcerer, wizard, whatever. Well, your human wizard is more intelligent with your power gaming. You know, you know me. I'm gonna be a wizard with a big strength. Like, ah, yeah, I might have magic missile, but I'll push on you too. Uh, so uh, that's a big problem, and I, I don't like it at all. The the fact is, it, humans have like a floating plus six bonus. Hopefully, I'm hoping Wizards of the Coast that that is a typo. It doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, let's shoot. In all honesty, elves should have probably a bonus to at least dex, uh, intelligence, and charisma over a human. But for game balance purposes, you're like, well, let's just give it to him for one stat. Okay, I, I okay, okay, uh, okay. But humans, they over incentivize, and they've been doing this since third edition. In sec, in AD and D, there was not, no incentive to play human at all. You could dual class, which sucked. Multi-classic was much better than dual-classic. Dual-classic was, was, it was, it was part of AD&D's problem. It was ridiculously bizarre house rules that somehow got published. It was like, these don't make any sense. It was so unclean and unsmooth. But in this version, from, from 3.0 3 onwards, they incentivized humans. Humans were the power, oh, humans were a powerhouse race. Humans for the feet, humans for the feet, humans for the feet. And they, they put humans over like that. Like, well, I'm not trying to see why you would incentivize people to really play humans after all. In AD&D, &D, when there was no incentive to play them, loads of people played humans. Now people want to play humans. They like to play humans. It's, of all the races, the one you need to incentivize the least. What you need to incentivize is things that people aren't necessarily huge to do. And you start incentivizing, and they go, well, yeah, it's gotten a little better. If it was a four, or maybe it's a four and a half now. Eh, maybe I'm thinking more about it. But the over-incentivation of humans is ridiculous and it's problematic too because again we don't know what those bonuses equate out to before if you had a bonus to dex that means you were more dexterous than a person we can relate to that easy it's like okay i'm a person so i kind of know how what the average dexterity of a person is taking statistics and modifiers completely out i know what the average dexterity or athleticism of a human being is what the average agility is but we're saying elves all elves on average are better than that they have more athleticism they have more agility they have a greater degree of that inherently than humans do. Elf, uh, dwarves are sturdier or hardier uh, than, than humans are. So that, that made uh, a great difference there. Another great thing that they took out, and they took this out in 4th edition, were penalties to stats. Again, you had a barometer. Humans were straight down the line. And in other things, adjudicated up and down from the standard base, which is a human. That is a wonderful game model. One of the better things that D&D put out mechanic-wise. It's a great innovation to the hobby that Dungeons & Dragons created that has been copied over and over again, and rightfully so, because it's a wonderful idea. Now, there are a lot of things Dungeons & Dragons game-wise, design-wise, for a long time has done wrong, and a lot of things have done right. And we're going to talk about all that here uh, unapologetically for how it interfaces with this new version of Dungeons & Dragons, Dungeons & Dragons Next. So when you're looking at that human, you have no bonus at all. But now you have bonuses to everything. So what does the elf's bonus to dexterity mean? It doesn't mean anything in my mind. It doesn't make any sense. 
and statistics, you you slowly almost liquefy the idea of concept of of concept and of conceptualization, and you you mold it down to just statistical uh, irrelevance. To well, I I just get a better bonus because uh, you just trail off. You have to be able to intellectually defend what you're doing in a role playing game, and I can't I can't defend that one. I just can't defend that one. It doesn't make any sense. I can't defend it, and neither can you. So let's talk about, you know, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. The, the, the removing of the, the penalty, I think, is just a terrible idea. I've actually heard some people who are, hey, I don't want to play a character with a penalty. <laughs> what would you possibly care? In frailties, we find the most commonality. We find the most ability to sympathize with things. It's like the stake through the heart of kryptonite. Those ground that super powerful thing. Then the, the elf, you know, is grounded by his frailty. The dwarf by his uh, social awkwardness. The halfling by its physical weakness and small stature. So, using these things in a game is, is almost, it seems almost a necessity to have that idea. It helps us to relate and understand them, and it helps to to show where where humans are. And I don't say you have to have humans as a standard. I mean, the standard could be halflings, orcs, gnolls. It could be a tree, and it doesn't really matter. But something needs to be the standard barometer. Something needs to have no statistical modifiers at all, and everything else needs to be built up around that. So I find that is is just a deficiency in this version of D and D. So it gets you know, a pretty hefty. Minus off there. I think the way they put humans out together is like F minus. Uh, you know, we give them a zero percent out of out of a possible all the points. <laughs> so that's not a good score. Zero out of all the points for you, uh, human. So they seem to be the power gamer paradise. The fact that you can get that extra bump up bonus on the the general generic weapons. I'm an orc with an axe. I'm an elf with an axe. Sorry, it's like ah, I'm a guy. It's not playing. So. Those are, uh, those are, again, failings of the game. They're problems because it creates a repetitive situation. Now, in the classes, they do this as well. You get an extra stat point based off your class, which, quite frankly, is a bad idea because you are, you are directing people towards playing the game a certain way. Fighters need to be physical. Wizards need to have a high intelligence. Well, no. Well, why can't I play the wizard... Who doesn't have a high intelligence, but maybe he gets by with a good wisdom, or maybe he gets by because he just pummels people. Like he's like, oh, I've run out of spells. Oh, <laughs> like, oh God, magic missiles of his fist. You know, he's like, yeah, I mean, I got an 18 strength. I might have only a 12 intelligence, but you know, I might even have an eight intelligence. You know, <laughs> the, the 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 you know, and the wizard class playing the guy who graduated last. I had the the, high, the lowest GPA, but I got these, Bubba. <laughs> and you just start sticking people in the eye. Those kind of concepts are wonderful, and I don't like forcing characters into the, these narrow paths. The character that I created, I chose the High Elf Fighter. And I chose Fighter because it's the easiest class to pick up when you don't want to ginger pick through all the rules. And I didn't, so I did. I picked the Fighter, and I picked the Elf. So, and of course, I had really no choices. I didn't want to play a human, particularly after I saw the Power Gamer on him. I didn't want to play a half thing. I wasn't going to play a dwarf. So my choice was an elf. I had two different options of an elf. I said, yeah, the quick elf or the smart elf. Well, I'm going to go smart. Well, the system apparently, from what I could deduce, gives you absolutely no bonus at all for having a high intelligence as a fighter. This is a tremendous failing on the game. Even, like in 3.5, I thought... Dude, the intelligence was not incentivized anywhere near enough for a martial character. Let's face it, two people go in, one of them smarter, and everything else is equal. The smarter guy is going to win. He's going to be the one that comes home. There are, there are in a real combat situation, a huge bonus to someone who is intelligent brings over dum-dums. So, there should be a statistical equivalent to that in a uh, RPG, a fantasy RPG. There did not appear to be any in this one outside of, well, maybe if you took up a, a skill that had intelligence, you get a bonus. <laughs> not nearly enough compared to the huge deficiency you're going to take not being the strongest fighter or the quickest or, or what have you. So to me, quite honestly, from, from working with systems that are, quite frankly, uh, more concept 
accommodating. Uh, I, I, I was pissed off. I was literally furious by the time I'd made the character. I was like, hey, my choice doesn't matter. I might as well just pick high strength and drop a three into intelligence. Doesn't matter anyway. So I find that, that, that particular aspect of the game uh, honestly a little uh, infuriating and depressing. So that was, again, uh, another failing on the game's part. They have this mechanic where... And, you know, I think it's still, they don't want you really quite divulging all their mechanics. So I'm not going to go into really explaining it. But if you, when you're looking at the system, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You get this extra die, and it's based off, like, basically how good your character is at fighting. Like, you know, fighting or, or stacking someone in the eyeball with a glaive or whatever it is. So when you're, when you're fighting, <clears throat> you get this extra die, and you can jump it around in different places to modify stuff. This will be the part of the game that gets broken. You will have... This is what, when you get Splatboat creep. This is really what makes makes the break. You take this feat and that feat and that feat. And these feats are made by three different people. Bob, Sally, and Jim all wrote these different books. They did not read what the other person wrote. And when they... The few times they skimmed over or heard... They're not carefully reading the feats. You're like, oh, God, if this feat... If you have this feat, I have this feat. No, no, no. It... it it, these are things that slide through. The power gamer goes, he eh, has to get over in the game because he can't role play. So he picks up all these little little tools he can and he assembles them to make this uh, this aspect of breaks. And I will tell you right now, this die type gimmick that they have is going to be number one thing when they have D&D Nexter. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah. Your main man will still be here to talk about that when it comes out in 2.9 years. Uh, so... That's going to be a big thing that people say. Oh, the die mechanic, it was so broken. I'm calling it before the game is even out. That is going to be the mechanic that people are just yelling about and are not happy. And they're going to say, oh, what power gaming abuse. Not, not right off the bat, not out of the, not, not in the first book, but, but down the line. It, it, I can just see the power game potential all over that. If by some chance they're very careful with their, their, their feet pump out. Maybe they can prevent that, but I certainly don't see that happening. I see that really getting oddly abusive there. I don't know if this is a typo in the book or if this is the way that it's going to come out. In the earlier editions of like in AD&D, once you get like ninth level and sometimes 10th level, after that, your character got way, you were nowhere near as powerful. Like you didn't, you didn't get like full hit dice and I think there were like other things you didn't get. So, it kind of helped to prevent against that Superman cap that you see in Pathfinder. You're like, hey, I'm 16th level, and I can beat Superman to death with my, with my hands. I'm so powerful. Uh, to help prevent against that, to keep characters more, uh, a bit more fragile, a bit more believable, they, they limited that kind of power. So maybe the fact you only get feats at uh, third, well, I guess first, third, sixth, and ninth level was designed to prevent you from having too many feats, too many options. I don't know. But that, that's how it was written in, in the book that I read, or the, the little PDF I read. thought that was odd. I could, understand, I could see that working uh, either way. They, the way they did skills, I, I, you, you, anyone that watches my channel, you know what I thought about their skill system. Horrible, F-. minus. They essentially just dug up non-web proficiencies and threw them in there. You, you had, I forget what it was, like four or six skills. But you get them all matched, and I blame power gamers for this, like I do many things. Because they, they would look at a character and go, oh, I'm playing a thief, so I need to have my lock picks and move silently and hide in shadows, max, 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 max. And everything was always maxed, so the skill was always maxed. So the people that are making the game go, oh, well, the skills are maxed, so we need to have maxed skills in here. No. You need to be able to make the concept. If my concept calls for creating, if I'm creating an NPC and he's 20th level, and he knows barely how to ride a horse. He knows a tiny bit about magic. He's got one rank in Knowledge Arcana. He's got one rank in Ride. He can do these things, but barely. Maybe he's only a little, maybe he's kind of good at it. Maybe he's like four ranks. But that doesn't mean he is plus 20. That doesn't mean he's all the way up here and he's like, yeah, I can do all this. Great. You know, and that can also give a, a wider a range of, of skill, but to a lesser degree. And when you're role-playing an extremely powerful NPC, and the player's asking the question, and he returns information as if he does, in fact, have two ranks of knowledge nature, they're asking the questions. It's like, well, well, yeah, I mean, I know an answer to that. You could ask me stuff in real life that, that I know a little bit about, and I could give you an answer, you, but it might not really be the absolute best answer. It might not have, you know, a tremendous, tremendous bearing for I know a little bit about cars, 
but I'm definitely not the guy you want to talk to. But if you made that mistake, <laughs> that's a jack to you. I could answer your questions. And if you didn't realize that I didn't have that, that mastery level of information that you wanted, that's just on you, isn't it? And it's the same thing with that high-level NPC when you pull that scene off. And then later the player's talking, oh, wait a minute. He doesn't really know. It's not that he's wrong, but he just... And then that light goes on, and all of a sudden, man, are they, are they pulled in. They are, they're sucked. Because you, show, you already showed how powerful the character was. Now you're showing limitation. You see, so when the game system doesn't give you the capacity to actually make a character... I don't know what you do with it, to be honest with you. The game, this is what a game system needs to do. Allow you to make what's in here. I mean, what's in here has to be somewhat reasonable. I can't be like, okay, well, why can't I make Optimus Prime at first level in the D&D game? Not something to do that kind of ridiculousness, but the same concept I've just explained. To have highs and lows. You have to have the lows there. And, and they seem to just completely, completely oblivious to it, which is very video gamey to me. And uh, I do not like it. No, sir. I didn't like it. So, you have that issue there with the skills. Didn't care for them. I did like the fact that in the pole or the feet section, they did have a feet right in the, right in the, the beginning document for pole arms. As I remember, it sucked, but I was still happy to see it there. Because guess who picked a glaive? Uh, actually, I think I had a fashion fork. But I used the stats for a glaive. I think there's only one pole arm in the in the manual. But I said, look, I'll just take this one and make it a fashion fork. Because that, that pole arm is horrifyingly awesome. So, I picked that. I did that. That was the, the sort of experience I had with the character. I can't really tell you too much about how the magic looked in the game. The overall idea, the thing you want your main man to tell you, though, is should you buy this? Let me ask you a question first. There are now, I don't even know, what, 13, 1,000 editions of Dungeons and Dragons. They continue to come out. They continue to come out in the same pattern. Dungeons and Dragons does not seem to address with the issues, with, with the additions, any of the issues of the game. They are giving you the same thing. It's it's hex based. It's a hex based game, and a hex based is a box, and a box limits you. It limits uh, the imagination in a vast amount of ways. This version seems in the problems to have all the problems of fourth, all the problems of three point five, all the problems of third, all the problems of Pathfinder without addressing the weaknesses, without addressing the uh, ability to teach role-playing. I honestly think Dungeons & Dragons is an absolutely horrible game for anyone to start with. Okay? And the reason being, it's on the high end of it's on the high end of medium complexity to maybe even the low end of complexity. There's an immense amount of rules to learn in Dungeons & Dragons. The system is not intuitive. None of them have been. Uh, the th 3.5 system was obviously vastly more intuitive than the AD and D system, which, which every person I ever I taught so many people how to play D and D, and they would all be lost. It goes up now, it goes down. It, it was not intuitive. It was not smooth. Yes, you might know it, but this it's the beauty of a system is can I teach somebody who has never played a role playing game how to run the system in ten minutes of of one on one time? That's all the time I need to spend with a player to get a system over. If the system can do that, I'm happy. If it can't, I'm not. This system, I don't think you could teach someone that's never played a role-playing game before that. Here's the problem you have. The player focuses heavily on the mechanics instead of the role-playing, instead of the conceptualization of their character, and they get overwhelmed, then they get withdrawn, they get wallflowery. It creates a huge amount of problems. Mechanics, the only reason to have mechanics is to facilitate your play, to make your game the best experience possible. You might not want role-playing in your game. You might want hex-based action and, and a essential miniatures war game or board game out there. And if that's the case, I, I still don't think this is really going to be the game for you. I think there's games that handle those aspects. Better than that, for the Dungeons and Dragons, the biggest problem I have with this is you have the latest and greatest people out there. They have to have the new thing. They have to fill their shelves with whatever books are out there. They will buy them. They don't care. If that's you, and you are going to be watching this video, it might not be you, but the next guy is probably out there. So, you're going to buy it, and, and that's fine. You'll probably run it and play it and learn the rules. But if you can't <clears throat> see yourself buying this, you know, it might be for the fact that you already have Dungeons and Dragons, and the experience of this game isn't going to be that different 
than the experience you have with the fourth edition with the third 3.5 with your Pathfinder books or your 3.0 books with your AD&D books with your basic set books it's still Dungeons and Dragons it's not radically different a new game it's not something different if you've never played Dungeons and Dragons before you can go on eBay and buy like a collection of AD&D second edition books for nothing and probably fourth edition books too because that edition uh, was unpopular and I think the people that liked it are going to migrate right over to this edition making those books almost almost worthless. I think 3.5 books and Pathfinder books are still pretty expensive, but I will tell you, you can buy ed and first edition and second edition books in enormous lots, you know, for, I don't know, when I was looking at them, I think they were shipped to your house like a dollar each for like, I don't know, 40 books. It's like, there's more books than you're going to read. It's like, here is all the books you ever need to play the game. The, the problem is, there's an enormous amount of games out there. Do you want to spend your money on something you already have, if you have Dungeons and Dragons. If you don't, eh, the edition's probably more or less close enough to, to the other ones. But why would you buy the same thing? It's It didn't have enough differences in the way... Mechanics can be different without really affecting a gameplay. It's how do the mechanics prop up the gameplay? How do they change what actually happens at your game table or your gaming space. Mechanics do this. However, the promotion of these mechanics is into a, a chain. It's, it, they get the module chain, they have the miniature chain, the hex grid chain, the, on all the things that go, the accoutrements, the tiles, the everything, the, the virtual laptop. It's to, to force you into, a, into that five foot square, and the reason they do that is to, to charge you for over and over and over and over and over, and over again products. Now. If you want that, if you want that play with all the miniatures and everything, and things that you quite frankly don't need and quite honestly will make your game of a lower level uh, of role-playing intensity, but they do give you uh, an additional degree of tactical uh, ability in the game. So there's your trade-off. And if that's what you're looking for, I think this edition will probably supply it to you as well as 4th edition, as well as Pathfinder, as well as D&D 3.5. Uh, so I honestly, this is my honest review here I don't see why you'd buy this as opposed to buying, if you were new to the game we're going to buy a, a stack this big of AD and d second edition books for the, the price of the core books you could buy an entire collection of AD and d second edition books on YouTube, of AD and d 3.0 books are, are cheap as well and they're close enough, I'm just talking for you for the consumer, I get a lot of kids 12, 19 out there, I know you don't have a huge amount of money, and the hundred bucks, God, maybe even more, it's going to cost you to buy this base set. You can get an entire library. You can get enough books literally to play Dungeons and Dragons for the rest of your life. The Outside of the idea of the latest and greatest, I don't really see why somebody would buy this edition as opposed to any other edition. And that's what Dungeons and Dragons competes with, earlier editions of itself, because it's, it's, a, it's a reprint of the same thing. But is it worth spending your money on? That ultimately is your decision, but your main man's decision is uh, we're definitely not going to be buying it. We're not going to be supporting it. We're not going to be reviewing the books here outside of maybe if they if Wizards wants to send me some for free, maybe I'd review them. I don't really want to read them, to be honest with you. But I'm not going to say that uh, for free I wouldn't review them just, uh, just as, a, as a favor to the RPG hobby. But I, I can't see any real, any real interest in here. There are a load of games out there for people that love the hobby of role-playing games. And I would, quite frankly, say take a look at those and think about buying one of those before you invest in the latest edition of Dungeons & Dragons. Boom!